Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. 1 Chronicles 16.9 Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Revelation 15.4 Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Exodus 15.11 Speak to the congregation of the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus 19.2 Please join me in prayer. O oh, holy God, you demand holiness from your people. May we come in touch today with just how awesome you are in your holiness. And may we see ourselves in reality, so much beneath who you are. Help us to put away those unholy things out of our lives, those deeds and those words, those thoughts that don't reflect you. And may we increase in holiness so that we may be holy, even as you are holy. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. to be holy. When we say God is holy, God is pure. What does that mean? It's hard to 
to kind of wrap your head around, isn't it? And to really understand those, those words, what it means. So I brought some things to try to help us understand that. Um, I have some chicken broth here. I use chicken broth for all sorts of things to add to my soup or um, to add to different dishes that I'm cooking. So it says chicken broth. But you know when I look on the ingredients, it says chicken stock, yeast extract, water, carrot juice, celery juice, onion juice. That sounds like a lot more than just chicken broth, doesn't it? So see, it's not pure chicken broth because it's got a lot of other things, a lot of other junk mixed in with it, doesn't it? Let's try something else here. Ah, oh, here we go. This says 100% apple juice. Apple juice, okay? Well, let me just check the ingredients. When I look at the ingredients here, I see apple juice, there you go. But then I see water, ascorbic acid, citric acid. Hmm, that doesn't sound like 100% apple juice, pure apple juice, does it? It's, I mean, they've added water to it, I guess to make it go further. So that's not 100% apple juice, is it? That's not pure. Ah. Uh, who doesn't like chocolate? Got some chocolate kisses here. Who doesn't like chocolate? So let's look what we have here. What's in the ingredients here? Ah, uh, let me find the ingredients. Okay, milk, cocoa butter, uh, chocolate, there's some chocolate. Uh, Soy, okay, so not pure chocolate, is it? It's got other things in it. Ah, lemonade, lemonade, lemonade. Made with real lemons. Okay, what else is in it? Water, lemon juice, um, Sodium, salt, potassium, calcium, a sweetener, a yellow dye. <laughs> so that doesn't sound like real lemonade, does it? It's not pure. Ah, but alcohol, alcohol, that's a good thing to, to have around the house to, to clean a wound or, you know, so it's alcohol. But wait, I don't know if you see this, it says 70%. So it's not pure either. Hmm. No, it's not pure either. See, when we say that God is pure, he is completely God. He is different from anything else because he is 100% God. He is pure, he is holy. Our pastor is preaching this morning from a, a passage in Isaiah. And it's about a man who was able to see God. And when he saw him, he said, I am himself. I am a man of unclean lips. You know what that meant? That he wasn't pure. He wasn't completely clean as God is. He's not because, you know, he has said some things that probably he shouldn't have. He has done some things that he shouldn't have. He has other stuff in him, other junk in him, just like some of these other things that we have that makes so that it's not pure. It's not completely what God is. That's what it means to be holy. So listen to our pastor this morning as he talks about the holiness of God. And listen to him because we are to be holy, clean, 
as God is holy. So what does that mean? Listen and see if you can figure that out. God is holy. He's different from all else, distinct in essence, unique in the universe. He transcends his creation. He's separated from sin. He's completely other. If you could only understand one thing about God, understand this. God is holy. God's holiness is so far above us that we could not understand anything about him without his revealing himself to us. He's expressed himself and his holiness in creation. He's instilled his holiness within us by giving us a universal moral code to order our lives. He's revealed himself to us through angels, through prophets, scripture, through the indwelling Holy Spirit, and through Jesus Christ. God in the flesh. Yet, if we should pour over the many revelations of God in an attempt to comprehend His holiness, we would fall far short of grasping just how utterly pure He is. To find ourselves in the presence of God's holiness immediately prompts a sense of awe. We shudder to realize just how much our sin separates us from Him. We tremble that the royal robes of his righteousness far exceed the filthy rags of any goodness that we pretend to possess. In response to this introduction, let's turn to Scripture to understand God's holiness more, cl more clearly. Isaiah's calling as a prophet of God may be found in Isaiah chapter 6. Would you turn there with me? Isaiah Chapter 6. Isaiah was in the temple on the occasion of the king's death. King Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 52 years. During the period of Uzziah's reign, the nation prospered. Deserts were reclaimed by water conservation. Jerusalem's walls were constructed. A large army was maintained. The nation's Prosperity under Uzziah was considered to have been a result of the king's fidelity to God. At the end of his life, however, King Uzziah developed leprosy as a direct result of disobedience to the temple priests who forbade him from burning incense on the altar. He was forced into isolation due to the contagious nature of his disease. Without a cure, he used pottery shards to scrape the decayed skin from his body. 
His clothing was burned to prevent anyone from coming into contact and contracting the leprosy. It was a pitiful ending to a king who had led the nation to such great prosperity. Set in juxtaposition, Isaiah sees a vision of King Uzziah and the Lord. From the filthy rags of the king to the overflowing train of the Lord's robe, Isaiah describes an encounter with the holiness of God. Please follow along now in Isaiah chapter 6 as I read verses 1 through 7. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with the tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. What a magnificent scene. Could you picture that in your mind? I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted. What an amazing contrast between the earthly king who failed his people, sinned against the Lord, and died a leper's death, and the almighty, omniscient, omnipotent God. Maybe Isaiah had in mind the throne of King Solomon, the most prosperous king in Israel's history. It was written of Solomon that his throne was perhaps grander than any other. It was fashioned of ivory and covered with gold. It was set with rubies, sapphires, emeralds, and other precious stones that shone with the most brilliant, the most dazzling, the most fascinating hues and colors. In 1 Kings chapter 10, we read that his throne was placed at the summit of six steps so that the king was high and lifted up. The six steps led to the seat. On the first step, a golden lion lay facing a golden ox on the opposite side. On the second step, a golden wolf faced a golden lamb. On the third step, a golden tiger faced a golden camel. On the fourth, a golden eagle faced a golden peacock. On the fifth, a golden cat faced a golden rooster. And on the sixth, a golden hawk faced a golden dove. Higher still, above the throne, a golden dove held a golden hawk in its beak. King Solomon's throne was the talk of all the reigning kings and princes. They came to marvel at its wonders and admire its beauty. Later, the throne was carried off to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar, who had conquered the Hebrew Empire. It was then absconded by the Persians before disappearing into obscurity. If an earthly king's throne could be so adorned, how much more adorned is, would be the beauty of the throne of the Lord in heaven? Oh, that's what Isaiah was seeing in his vision. The Lord is the divine heavenly king whose throne is secure in heaven, high and exalted in the universe. Isaiah sees God on his throne, high and exalted, high and lifted up. Isaiah's vision then includes the exalted imagery of the Lord with a train of his robe filling the temple. Typically, the train of the robe is linked to the majesty and power of the king. The imagery of the robe is taken from the practice of earthly kings. As one king defeated another king, he would cut off the king's, the defeated king's train and sow it to his own train. Eventually, this train became longer and more glorious as he was the obvious victor for many battles. Solomon's train, the skirts of his robe, flowed downward from the throne onto the six steps and out onto the palace floor. Even the train of the great King Solomon 
paled in comparison to that of the Lord whose train filled the temple. In this case, the exalted Lord's train filled the entirety of the temple. The Hebrew king did not have a throne in the temple because the king was not an object of worship. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, says the Lord. So whether Solomon or Uzziah or one of the many other kings of Israel, the king's throne was in the royal palace. But when we see the throne of the Lord in Isaiah's vision, it is located in the temple, the place of worship. That's the most appropriate because the Lord is holy. He is above even the great kings in his holiness. There's no end to his kingdom. He reigns over everything, all of creation, and with power. The throne is high and exalted. The train fills the temple. And added to this vision, we see a small glimpse of the seraphim, heavenly creatures of power and majesty that can't stop shouting praise to the Lord. Who are these heavenly beings? The seraphim, plural for seraph, are mentioned in the Bible only in Isaiah's vision. The word seraph means burning one or fiery one. Does that describe their form? Are they flames of fire that fly around the throne of God? Perhaps. Yet Isaiah's description has them bearing the resemblance to humans with faces, feet, hands, and voices. They worship in a loud voice continually before the Lord declaring, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The seraphim are the worship leaders that lead all of creation in singing glory to God. Who are they leading? A multitude of the heavenly hosts, surely. The faithful of every age from every continent. The stars and the planets, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and every other living creature that moves on the earth. The Bible even tells us that the rocks have the capacity to call out to praise to God, and, and we, we marvel at that. Now mix all of these with the voices of every organist and every pianist playing instruments in perfect tune. Psalm 150 encourages us to praise God with trumpets, harps, strings, pipes, and resounding cymbals. What is it that prompts such praise from all of creation? It's nothing but the holiness of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And in response to the seraphim praising the Lord of hosts, the foundations of the temple shook and the house was filled with smoke. This is an allusion to the tabernacle, that tent of worship that was used during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. When smoke filled the tabernacle, it was an indication of the Lord's presence. Another revelation of God's holiness can be found in Revelation 4. Let me read that quickly. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf, the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, the Almighty, who was and who is, and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the thrones, saying, Worthy are you, our God, who to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and because of you, you know, because of your will, they exist and were created. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, and full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was, 
who is and who is to come. These marvelous created beings never cease to declare the eternal holiness of God. He's eternal. The Lord God Almighty, the one who is master over everything, the one who has created all things, the one who has all power, he is God and he was, he is, and he always will be. This scene is incredible, but it doesn't end with this. Every time the creatures declare this beautiful and terrific truth, the elders who are seated around the throne worship him, casting the crowns before his feet, declaring, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they, were, they exist and were created. God is clearly above all of his creation. There's nothing that is above him. Now there is, nor is there anything in his creation that is outside of his control. God is entirely different than absolutely everything we see and observe. God is holy. His holiness is directly linked to him being the eternal creator. God is holy because he's eternal. This makes him different other, not like you and me, the only correct response to the holiness of God is just worship. With all of the universe driven to worship, there yet remains one holdout. Humanity remains in rebellion to God, instilled with a choice people have chosen to glorify themselves and not God. God, who is not like man, will bring swift justice upon mankind for this rebellion. Because God is different, other, holy, he has not left us alone to perish under his justice forever. He did something that no man would do, nor could do. He provided a spotless lamb to be sacrificed so that all who call upon Jesus Christ would be saved. God made a way through Christ, for sinners to enter into the presence of God once again and worship. Will you join the chorus of creation in worshiping the holy God? Will you bow in reverence with the angels around God's throne in acknowledgement of his holiness? Will you admit your own sinfulness and come to this holy God for forgiveness? Listen to how Isaiah's vision concludes with a message of hope for you and me. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. I urge you right now to bow in praise to God, confess your need before a holy God, and receive forgiveness for your sin. Cleve is going to play the Lord's Prayer. I would like to draw your attention to the words of that prayer. You know them well. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed means greatly honored, revered, holy. I urge you to sing along with a great sense of awe as you sing to this holy God. <laughs> 